Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Live here from Northwestern Vermont, where I always give you the weather forecast. Cloudy, snowy, cold. Going to get like frighteningly cold this weekend here in Vermont. Where are you? Uh, go ahead in the comments. Tell me where you're watching from today. We'd love to hear from you. We have such an exciting guest. I'll tell you, I, I met this person. Uh, I, I tuned in that night to her live stream and um, I had to wipe off the steam from my screen. That's how uh, high energy she is. So uh, that's fantastic. Hey, I've been telling you a bit about this book. Uh, I'm going to underscore again. I get absolutely positively nothing from promoting this book. Only that these folks uh, at Business Made Simple really helped me out a lot this year. Donald Miller is the author. Uh, they announced this morning that there is a summit coming up. If you go ahead to businessmadesimplesummit.com, you can sign up for this uh, summit relating to the book. I recommended buying the book uh, on Amazon, anywhere else you buy books. Actually, how about your local bookstore? That would be fantastic if you did that. But I'm just going to recommend you do it. As I've mentioned before, it's a book that has a unique approach in that every day, once you get the book, you sign up for it, you get a video from Donald on the subject. So really a, a, a strong, strong book for people to uh, you know, be in business and, and to be a part of that. So uh, yeah, and here's our guest. Dr. I is waiting and uh, so good to see she's back there. She's going to share her story with us. So, so glad she's here. Ann Seaton, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate that. So let's get things rolling. Um, I want to give this introduction to you. Um, the title uh, we put out there for this, this discussion today is from depressed college professor to CEO. And there's a wonderful video that explains uh, what Dr. I has been up to. So let me go ahead and play that for you right now. And then we'll bring her here live on screen. So after I'm going to stop that one second because we did not have audio to it. This is live, folks, and that's what happens. So we'll do that again, and we'll make sure we have the audio attached. Here we go. So after being a college professor for 10 plus years, I realized the traditional education space is not preparing our students for the future, uh, especially those students who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs, to become disruptive leaders. We create worlds, we create borders. And I think a holistic education needs to be free. It needs to be across disciplines. It needs to be across culture, across gender. Diversity can bring changes that we haven't seen before. Learning from academics is not enough. The speakers I have invited to come to this immersion, all of them are practitioners who are actually in the field. To me, that is very, very important. Education needs to be more relevant, more practical, and more applicable to a person's needs. To learn a foreign language, you want to be completely submersed, but yet we as a society believe that it works a different way in how to become successful in business. Street smarts, according to me, trumps book smart every single day. And learners who always come first in class will end up working for the guys who sit in the back bench because those are the people who actually think outside the box. And that's what you need to become an entrepreneur. What they weren't teaching me in school, presentation skills, being a good public speaker, and treating people with dignity. These are little things that I had picked up in life. What Classroom Without Walls represents to me is that life happens, and a lot of it happens outside of what is taught in schools. But to me, as an educator, as an entrepreneur, I think everyone agrees that it is the journey that is transforming the students. Diversity helps to create more ideas, fosters a space for creativity and we are here i think every one of us to give each of their own unique experience to create a new synergy so classroom without walls just gives young people the opportunity to see things from a different perspective to meet speakers from all over the world to meet mentors that they otherwise wouldn't have met or spoken to to meet new friends from different parts of the world I truly believe the stage on the stage model is broken. And I think students need to realize that they are teachers as well. This is more alternative 
and disruptive. It gives people real world opportunity to actually learn from the full immersion of facts. But in order to really take your, your, your talent, your skill, your craft to the next level, you have to be willing to also unlearn some things and relearn. So even as a practitioner here, I have learned. I wish there was something like this when I was in high school myself. So in as much as these kids are, are learning from us, oh my gosh, trust me, he constantly learn from them. Now I truly believe the best education happens outside the classroom. Learning may happen inside the classroom, but transformation happens outside the classroom. That is an extremely motivating video to me. Joining me right, joining me right now is Dr. I, uh, and she's going to come here and tell us a bit more about her journey. Hi, Dr. I. Oh, thank you so much for having me. That is a, a very emotional video even for me to watch, so I'm honored to be here. Well, you know, it's emotional for me, too. I, um, I was just saying to my daughter, who's a senior in high school yesterday, high school was just a, a fantastic time, and... Um, especially because I had an experience not like that one, but maybe somewhat similar in that uh, I was uh, in, I grew up in the state of New Jersey and <clears throat> was part of a, a camp that came together in the summertime uh, for student leaders. And I know what that's like, but I see that video and I, I get goosebumps. I absolutely get goosebumps. We're going to come back around to that journey in a minute. You, you and I talked about the subject today and I was kind of blown away by by what you had proposed. You said from depressed college professor to CEO. So um, you mentioned the D word, and I know during the pandemic, <clears throat> being depressed has become more of a open topic, but still not to the point where we really have big conversations about what depression is. So let me start with that. What do you mean by a depressed college professor? Yeah, it's such a great question. I mean, like I taught in the classroom for 15 plus years and I got my master's degree from uh, from Syracuse. I got my PhD from the University of Maryland. Even while I was pursuing my uh, graduate degrees, I was already teaching in the classroom. So over the last almost two decades, I saw personally and painfully how the current education system is actually hurting our children on so many levels. For example, and uh, reflecting on myself as a teacher, I mean, I even got some awards for being a good teacher, but I still feel like there was something that is really important that is missing in the classroom teaching. For example, our children and research has shown this, as they become more educated, their creativity actually decreases. Can you imagine that? As they become more educated, their creativity decreases. A quick story. Wow. Yes, I don't know if you heard of this. Uh, it's a study conducted by NASA. They want to mm -hmm. study people's creativity. So they ask children, four years old, five years old, hey kids, how many ways can you think of using a paper clip? So yeah. the four years old, five years old, they were like, this, 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 and that. So hundreds of, so five years later, listen, this is crazy. The same group of children, their creativity dropped from 98% when they were kids yeah. to 50% when they were high school students, teenagers. Another five years later, as they become working professionals, young adults, 2%. So from 98% yeah. to 2%, what happened? Wow. One reason is that they become more educated. So I see that in front of my students all yeah. the time. Imagine like I'm here to help my kids to be more creative, but I just feel like what I'm doing is actually making the situation worse. At the same time, innovation, right? We all want our kids to be innovative. Research has also shown that the higher the grade, the less likely the kid is to innovate. Yeah. So when you, when you read enough studies like that, you, you really, if you truly care about your students, you will really ask yourself, am I part of the problem or yeah. am I part of the solution? Well, so it's, me, it's, yeah, go it, ahead. It, it's an amazing point. I mean, because, you know, I, I, I know exactly what you're saying when, when the creativity leaves the child, right? Um, I believe it was Dr. Ken Robinson the first time I heard a theory like this, where, you know, the education system was designed, and I'll use this jar as an example, right? 
to fill the jar and fill the jar and fill the jar. And now there's a little bit of fluid here in the bottom that we'll call that creativity. The more you fill that jar, the more creativity gets pushed down into the mm -hmm. jar and filled with knowledge. Knowledge is great. And, uh, you know, I think even Einstein said, you know, knowledge is fantastic. Uh, believe me, I'm not quoting Einstein here. That knowledge is fantastic, but but creativity, ideas, thinking are the things that help us really grow. Would you, would you agree with, with that type of an approach? Oh, 100%. I mean, Einstein also yeah. said that I'm not talented. I'm just extremely curious about the problem, and I stay with the problems longer. So yeah. that is something I see missing in our students all the time. You know, I like I have been doing, I have done quite a few talks regarding my own journey. And yeah, my husband literally captured a picture of me. I'm drinking a bottle of wine. That is how depressed I was. Yeah, yeah. I cried. I cried almost every single semester. I felt so stuck. I yeah. knew the model was not working, but I yeah. didn't know what to do to make the model working. So that's kind of what started this journey to, to inspire me, even though after I got my PhD and so many degrees, I became a student again. So let me ask you, though, the, de the depression came from the fact that you felt that um, you were continuing to fill the jar, right? But that you were seeing perhaps um, the rebounded energy from your students wasn't there creative wise. Is that what was getting you down? Oh, totally. And uh, the, the typical question I heard a lot is, hey, Dr. I, will this be on the exam? Right. So tell me what you want. Tell me what you want. Don't, don't yes. Don't ask oh, me my gosh. Want. Tell yeah. me what you want. And the worst part is, like, you know, as a professor, we go to conferences. And uh, so every time when I canceled the class, everybody was so excited. They were celebrating, yep. like, hurrying. I, I, I just don't get it. I was like, wow, you guys, your parents paid thousands of dollars to have you in the classroom. And you, you, you just, like, couldn't care less about this. And the worst part is I became a teacher to engage in intellectual discussion with my students. But nobody was interested in intellectual discussion. Every single person cared about one thing. That is that piece of paper and the gray, the A, the B, they are receiving at the end. That's not why I became a teacher. But that is the, the, the biggest reason that made me feel very depressed because I literally care more about their learning journey, learning for the sake of learning, yeah. more so than the students. I'm not the only person. I want to talk to my friends from yes. you know, Howard, Stanford, or uh, that's just average uh, teaching schools. Everybody is dealing with a similar situation, and they yeah. just tell me, "Just you will get used to it." But I don't want to get used to it, and yeah. I. So that is, you know, I guess that's a difference between someone who is really obedient. You just follow the order. Someone who wants to be a change maker, or I call myself a disruptor, to, yeah. to be part of the solution. Yeah, I, you know, and, and I think about uh, something a friend of mine wrote recently about the statements that someone like uh, John F. Kennedy made about going to the moon, right? Or, or Steve Jobs said about the iPhone, right? This is what I want. This is what I want to accomplish. The education and the engineer says, no, 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 that's not possible. I didn't mm -hmm. learn that in school, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I didn't learn how to put a rocket ship with a trajectory strong enough, straight enough, high enough to get to the moon. I didn't learn to put the power of what is now 10 times, 20 times more powerful than the first PC I brought from, bought from my family is now in the palm of my hand. Engineers were not taught that, right? So, 100%. it's yeah. so sad that I have worked with so many students and also leaders. It is so sad to hear that most people say that today's students don't know how to dream, they have lost their ability to dream. But it is so sad when you see like younger kids, four years old, five years old, they are full of brilliant ideas. I want to do this, I want to do that. But by the time they get to college, they have no ideas. Their idea is tell me what you want me to do. And that becomes their idea. It is very sad. Like nowadays, I tell my own children and uh, like everything happens three times in life. The first time it happens in our mind. You have to believe in this idea, being unreasonable, being crazy. When you actually yeah. share this idea, people say, that's crazy. And then I, yeah. I tell my children and students, that means you are onto something big, right? So yes. Right. So that's like the first thing that happens in our mind. And the second time it happens in our heart, be the person who believes in yourself. And the third time it happens in real life, you take action. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So true. And I and so, you know, when you when you realize this as a college professor, you know, um, obviously you're brilliant. You know, you also know that if you're in a state that you're in at that point, you know, 
Well, I didn't mean to chuckle about the image of drinking out of the bottle of wine, you know, but, but I mean, you know, it's an image. Uh, you're also smart enough to say, this isn't working. I got to do something different. So what was that pinnacle moment like? What made you decide, yes, I've got to do something different. And what did you do? I think really, uh, really the pain was so strong. Like after, you know, constantly crying, not enjoying myself. And I remember even when I was listening to podcasts and uh, like listen to all those entrepreneurs and people say that I love Monday. I love my job. I literally thought in my mind that the host actually paid those people to say that. Because <laughs> it's like, no way. I have never met anyone who actually loved their job, right? Yeah. Because among my friends who are teachers, we always like, when is the summer? When is the summer? When is the winter break? Where like our life is for the summer vacation. And I just got so tired of that. Yeah. Like, am I going to live my life for the rest of my life like that? Right? Or I want to do something else. And I think also maybe part, like I also part of that, I think is mid-age crisis to really go with them to, to like, what do I want in life? I know this is something I don't want to do. I hate this. So that plays a, a big, a big, big, uh, big role in my kind of reinventioning journey to decide, you know, I don't like this school model. Why don't I? What if I build a better model? And so asking myself those what if questions, I think really, kind of push me to go further on this journey. And also, uh, I, I think also like hearing enough success stories from other people. And also I started to, to, to read the books outside of my immediate academic discipline and working with the coaches. I think they all play a role in terms of pushing me to, to believe in myself, to reinvent, to build a better model. And also what I discovered, I don't know if you, anyone watching this have ever heard of the saying, which I really love, which is the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. So what I learned was that if I try to have major radical innovations within the institution, I, I just cannot. There are limitations in terms of what I can do as a teacher. I have to follow so many orders. So what I discovered, the best way to create a model to build a new house was actually using a new set of tools outside the existing system. So that is another reason that I finally decided to build something outside, have nothing to do with the current model. It has well, been- Let me ask you, you mentioned your, your discipline too. Just tell the audience, what, what is your, your, your master's degree uh, and your doctorate in? Yeah, so I'm actually in uh, public relations, kind of- uh, I majored in public relations and later I started to teach more social media, uh, marketing mm -hmm. classes. Actually, this is another reason I was like, okay, I realized that I was teaching a very applied field of communication, right? Meaning that you really have to practice social media. You have to practice marketing. I realized this is laughable. Now, as I think about it, I have zero professional experience in terms of doing social media, in terms of doing communication, in terms of doing marketing. The only thing I taught my students were theories. I went to two good research universities, Syracuse and Maryland. I learned so many theories. So that's another kind of pinpoint in my journey was that students, they were telling me that my teaching is very dry. I taught mm -hmm. way too many theories. I wish I could give them more practical knowledge. Now I can teach, you know, from ideation to a six figure business. I can literally teach you how to do that. But back then I had no idea because my, my understanding is only from the books. And I'm not the only one. Just recently, yeah. I still have throughout the entire year, I always have professors from Ivy League school, from amazing research university reach out to me, ask me to give their students talks because they have no idea what they are teaching. They have all the theories. Yeah. That makes me feel so sad, makes me feel so frustrated. That's another motivation for me to leave the system to become a practitioner. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I know looking at your live stream, the one, the one show I mentioned when I that first day when I looked at your live stream, you were moving so fast. Your your guest was talking about new platforms. You were going there. Your your curiosity is is boundless and then you look at your resume you uh adobe uh you know uh hubspot these are all things that just don't come very easily to people who aren't curious 
So you mm-hmm. obviously have a, 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 a you know, a, 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 you know, a curiosity level. That, that's why I put that high energy thing in my my promotion of you being here today. <clears throat> I want to test to this theory that I just wrote down here as you were talking about, you know, creativity leaving us when we're young as we are getting educated. Um, and then if you can maintain that curiosity, that creativity, I wonder, uh, Dr. I, when you are an adult, especially with an adult with the hair color that I have, um, yeah. I'm a lot, <laughs> by the way, this is natural. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I'm a true believer in lifelong learning. I mm-hmm. just, um, to the point where I get annoyed at people over the age of 50 who, who just won't try things, who won't learn mm-hmm. things. Do you think there's maybe a connection between having the creativity driven out of us and then reaching middle age and beyond and saying, you know, I don't even need to learn anything anymore. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think the connection is there? Oh, I think that's such a great point. And also, I think we can trace that back to the traditional education model. I mean, you have children, I have children before we started homeschooling our kids and even the students I work with, because when you go to school, you are being told about what you need to do, right? So imagine your teachers are telling you, you know, first grade, you have to learn this, 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 and that, you know, graduate school, you have to learn this and that. So after so many years, your ability to think on your own behalf in terms of what you need to learn, you are losing that because for so long, you never get to practice that muscle. For your entire life, your learning journey is designed for you without your involvement, right? Then all of a sudden you graduated from school, you become older, life kicks in. And then now you're asking me to reactivate that muscle that I had when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's going to take a much longer time and effort. And most people are not willing to go through that because they are just used to it. Unless there is a teacher asking me to, or my boss asking me to get a certification, I'm not willing to do that. And so I think that's definitely a reason. Another reason is, is there is a, a Gallup study that came out uh, like I think two years ago, they surveyed 1 billion full-time workers. 85% of people actually hate their job. That is a very high percentage. 85%? Yes, yes. Wow. So curiosity has to be based on passion. And you cannot be curious about things that you are not passionate about. Wow. So if most people are working at a job that they hate, of course, there's no curiosity. That's, that's amazing to me as someone who has always loved my work, you know, um, I guess I never realized what a gift that is. You know, today I work with a consultancy. I absolutely love what I do. The, 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 the three decades I spent, um, you know, in the media that I, and the work that I did, like you said, Monday morning, I couldn't wait to get where I was working Sunday mm-hmm. night, working Saturday afternoon. I mean, you know, that's just the passion, but then mm-hmm. also too, I, I want to explore not only loving your work, but also loving kind of your life overall, having other interests outside of work. Um, I hate to kind of make it depressing this way, but, you know, and, and this is this is uh, symbolic. You turn off the machine, you go home, you sit in front of the couch, you watch TV, the weekend comes and goes, and you're back, you turn the machine on Monday morning. That's what sounds like when you say 85% of the people don't like their work. So, I mean, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but any tips for people to help them like their work? How can people find passion in what they do? Oh, totally. And then besides, those are, we're talking about the full-time workers, right? 85%. So just last year, there was a big study conducted by Yale University, and they surveyed 22,000 U.S. high school students. And guess what? Almost 75% of high schooler, high school students in the United States, they feel very negative about their high school experience, wow. including emotions such as bored, stress, and tired. So it's not only unique, this problem of not enjoying what I do, it's not only unique to people like us, working professionals, but it's also very, very common among today's students. They are going through a very, very tough time. And now it's on learning, everything's becoming worse. So the question you asked me is really, really good. Like how can we help them start to love their job even more? So it goes back to education. I think the biggest missing point in our education is understanding yourself. 
Yeah. And that's why at my school, a big chapter, big module that I work with my students is understanding yourself. We do Ikigai. I don't know if you know that, which is a really uh, popular Japanese concept. So which is the sweet spot between what you love, what you are good at, what is something that the society is willing to pay? So like four different bubbles. So that Venn diagram that brings it all together and they're exactly. in the middle. Exactly. When that sweet spot is that what you what you really yeah. want to pursue for your life. So that is one thing we do. We also do, do uh, value tests to help our students understand their core values. We also help them understand their strengths, understanding their personality. So this understanding of who you are, your core values, I think is the foundation to have a fulfilling life and fulfilling yeah. career. Because the, the reason that I now, I can say that I love Monday was because I went through this journey and I discovered I'm the type of person, I love freedom. I love working with myself. So now I literally designed a, a job, a career that is aligned with my core value. That's why I'm so happy. But most people and most students, even when they are choosing majors, I mean, you said you, your daughter is in high school, but most high schoolers, when they are choosing college, when they are choosing majors, they listen to their academic advisor, but they should listen to a life advisor, right? You cannot choose a choose a career only based on how many A's you are earning for physics, how many B's you are earning for language. You can't do that because success is an inside out journey. But if you are not doing the inner work to discover who you are, your core values, you only rely on the external things to find a job. Of course, you are going to end up doing something, even though you are making lots of money, you're not going to be happy because the internal part is not being fulfilled. You're still that big void, but very yeah. few people actually go through this process. So if this person is unhappy, with his or her job right now. And I really recommend this person work with a coach and to really go through, look at internally. Okay, I'm upset. What is the root, right? Behaviors are like the external things are only behavioral manifestation of what is inside. We really need to look at the inside, especially for young children. We need to really look at it. What are the things, who are you? What are the things you value? And then design a career based on that. Yeah. Well, you know, let me ask you a question. And then again, I, I not what we came here to talk about today, but you're, you've got the PhD. So I'm going to ask you the questions. Part of what you talk about uh, econ, you know, as an economist, which I'm not, but I'm saying um, there are some economic boundaries for some people perhaps to explore this. Are there not? First of all, you know, you, 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 you may not have the, the means by which to explore some of the things you're talking about. So let's start with that. For instance, you know, my daughter was able to go to Rome uh, last February. Not everybody uh, is able to, to do that for their student. Um, you've had opportunities, perhaps, you know, I've, I, I know when I was in high school, I didn't have those opportunities, quite frankly, I didn't. So is there an economic boundary sometime? And how do we, how do we coach students beyond that to keep on being curious, even well, though- they're yeah, I mean, like, yeah, so besides doing those internal exercises, there are so many surveys out, out there. You can do it for free. And uh, I'm also an advocate of using the tools that we already have. You and I were both on LinkedIn, and I love LinkedIn. Like, 90% of my clients actually come from LinkedIn. So wow. I think students should actually learn how to do digital networking, right? You don't need to have a million dollars to really get to know a leader. And what you can do if you are really good at this, you can practice digital networking and connecting with people that you want to become in the future and uh, be more intentional with networking and using the social media tools that they already have to leverage them to serve their needs. That's brilliant. Very few yeah. students are actually learning how to do this because I work with schools, many schools, high school schools, uh, middle schools, they completely ban social media, including LinkedIn. They mm. see that as very detrimental to yes. children's mental health. I mean, I say that as an uneducated fear, very uneducated. And we have to learn, we have to teach our children the other side of social media, which is not only to consume, that's how most students are using social right. media, but actually learn how to use social media to create. When you yeah. are creating, you are using social media to serve you. So right. all the students in my program, as young as 12, uh, 12, 10 years old, I help them create a LinkedIn and they use that to practice networking, connecting with like, 
lawyers, doctors, entrepreneurs, business leaders, and have a one-on-one check. This entire process is free. You can literally study abroad without traveling abroad. No, I, that's so true. I mean, I love that advice. And, um, you know, during COVID, I've had an opportunity during the pandemic to talk to to several college classes as a guest lecturer. And the things that I often say to students is there are three things you must keep in mind, especially as you're a junior or senior in college heading out to the world. Learn how to write, learn how to speak, and learn how to network. And those three things will put you head and shoulders above other people in the job marketplace. But that last one, networking, I mean, it's it's not one that is taught in schools. Um, and I so agree with you that, you know, I just said to my daughter recently, hey, well, you got to get going on your LinkedIn page. And she went, huh? Are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm serious because opportunities are going to come up in college and you need to have a presence. So um, mm-hmm. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. So um, let's uh, let's say we're, we're you know we 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 hit about the the, the twenty five minute mark of our discussion. We haven't even gotten to where you ended up as a CEO, and uh, that's why I know you've got this energy. So I got to bridle it a little bit. And let's <laughs> take us to, I, I want to bring us to your your um, your website, if that's okay with you. Oh yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, and and I uh, I you know I I I'm a really taken by this page right here, the Life Accelerator, Three Promises to Parents. And this, of course, is Classroom Without Walls. But I love these promises. So tell me what these promises are and what they mean to the parents that were that you're addressing here. Yeah, so this is actually the website for my for my uh, signature program at Classroom Without Walls. I have another website for only my business. So so what, what I discovered after being in the classroom for so many years is that School-based learning is only 20%, Mm -hmm. okay? But most parents and teachers are only looking at that 20%. But just doing that 20% is not going to help our children become life-ready, career-ready, and future-ready. So what I do at Classroom Without Wars is to really teach our students the 80% so that they can be empowered with not only school-based learning, but real-life skills, motivation and to become successful in life to not only find a job maybe even to create a job to learn how to think to learn how to dream big to learn how to communicate so we cover digital literacy we cover life skills we cover mindset so those Mm -hmm. three promises are kind of under the three core parameters that we cover at the classroom without was digital literacy you and i we were talking about digital networking building that online presence and you have a live streaming show and my I also coach my students to launch a live streaming show yes, so yeah. that they can develop communication skills. Because what I discovered is that most students don't have communication skills right. because they're only talking to their peers, right? right? So imagine if you only talk to people of the same age, how can you really develop true communication skills? It has to be in this intergenerational environment. So live streaming, talking to strangers, Very few students actually have an opportunity to talk to strangers, but you have to learn. That's really how you practice your craft when it comes to communication. So we coach them that, like, you know, digital literacy and life skills and the mindset. We literally show our students how to rewire the brain. We talk about reptilian brain. We talk about the limbic system. We talk about journaling. We talk about Mm -hmm. mindset, positive affirmation, all those things so that they are not only having the 20%, which is the tip of the iceberg, but they are actually having the entire iceberg to be future ready. So those are the promises that we give to the parents. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 great. You know, I was taken about. I love the video that I showed at the beginning, and I was taken by the one the one person who was probably I don't know if you call them counselors or teachers or the people that are leaders. You know, with the students, and she said we learn as much from them as mm-hmm. they learn from us. And I keep going back around to the life learn long longing thing. I keep going around to people with my color hair and saying, <clears throat> sit down with a sixteen year old and learn how to make a TikTok video. Mm. Sit down with a 16-year-old and learn how to edit a video on your phone, which mm. is so natural to kids today. Mm. And it's something that, you know, I think adults need to challenge themselves. So, you know, given that we're on LinkedIn today, 
What advice would you give to, to adults about continuing that lifelong learning journey and taking classroom without walls to your adult life and what you can learn kind of the other way around from, from someone who is maybe a high school or a college student. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I'm doing at Classroom Without Walls because one of my dreams, I'm such an advocate of lifelong learning. I have had enough of seeing my students after commencement, you know, throwing away their books, burning their, their books in your trash can. I was like, wow, right? is that how you perceive how you perceive the value of learning. I mean, that's really, they, they literally see learning only happens inside the classroom. That's why I call my school classroom without walls. Yeah. So at my school, we actually give our students lifelong access to our program. Yes. So what my slogan is one-time investment, lifelong access. So we oh. have students, you pay me once, even when you are 30 years old, when you are 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, come back to us. I'm, I'm still here until well, I die. I was still here. To your point, I got to tell you, we said about throwing the books out, right? I remember my first boss uh, at, at the first newspaper I went to work with, which, by the way, was an accident. You know, I'm educated in theater, but I needed a job with a car. And so I, you know, went to, went to work at a newspaper. My first boss said, I haven't read a book since the day I graduated college. Mm. With pride, you know? Mm. Now we're going back to the 80s, okay? That's a lifetime for uh, a lot of people watching this today. But I remember thinking right there and then that is not going to be me. That is not going to be me. I will not let that happen to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I was blown away by that. And so I think what you're saying, too, is that, you know, students even today are still thinking, oh, throw them out. You know, I don't have to ever look at another book again. And that's, you know, probably not the be the first step towards a fulfilling life, maybe. Is that is that a good assumption? Oh, totally. And also, I, I want to say on the student's behalf, it's also not their fault because, I mean, I was a student, I can't really, even though I got a PhD, I can't tell you how much I actually enjoyed the school type of learning because when students are in school and it's more so short-term memory, you are learning to regurgitate information, not so much for the sake of learning. And you learn what you are supposed to learn versus you learn what you are interested in learning. So I think if we allow our students to do more learning on things that they are interested in learning as opposed to what they are supposed to learn, I think yeah. we, maybe we are seeing a different picture because right now most of the learning is actually coercive, right? We force yeah. the kids yeah. to learn. Right. And, and no wonder they have so much negative feelings about what they are learning. I mean, yeah. even people say that children's attention span is short. I disagree. When you look at people playing games, they can focus on hours, right? Or like when us, like watch a movie, we can also spend at least an hour or two hours of focus on that. It's not the attention span issue. It's actually an interest issue. If I'm yes. interested in this, I can focus. But if I'm not interested in this, which is the case of many of the school learning, mm -hmm. and I'm not interested in this, therefore, yeah, I, I can't wait for this thing to be over. So I, I think, you know, if we want to see fundamental changes in our students in terms of embracing lifelong learning, we have to really dismantle the entire education model, which yeah. I don't think is going to happen in the near future. Yeah. Well, you're interesting. And Seaton says her hubby's home from surgery and resting, so she's enjoying this. Remind me how far more my education was the public library each week planting trees and managing property for wildlife with dad. Someone that comes from a background that was more than just go to school, come home. So Amen. and thanks for that comment. So true. I mean, that's the, that's the other part of classroom without walls, right? What you I mean, learn. Yeah. So true. I mean, there are three, I'm, my work is influence. I'm, I'm a constant reader. I don't even know how many books I read hundreds of them. And Daniel Pink talks about this uh, oh, yeah. and resonating with Anne's point, you know, this, uh, internal desire, intrinsic desire to learn, three core factors. One is purpose, another yeah. one is mastery, another one is autonomy. So for many of our children, they don't have the autonomy to decide what they want to learn. They also don't have that sense of purpose, which again is internally why I want to learn this. So when you don't have two of those things, of course, when learning is forced, you, 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 you're just not so into that, yeah. Yeah, that is so true. And thanks, Anne, for that comment. You know, let's come full circle on, on, on your journey, okay? Um, you know, you, you realize this as, as a college professor. You are now this uh, uber successful person that I'm not quite sure when you sleep, when I, when I you know, got to know you and looked into your background. Um, somehow I think, you know, nighttime looks like this, and then you're awake <laughs> again. But um, 
But, you know, uh, so where are you today? You know, you went from depressed college professor to today where when you look at your resume, I get tired just reading it. Tell us um, tell us where you are today and where that journey is taking. Now, I want to throw in there, too. You said I only had one of your, your websites up there. Tell me what the other one is, too. So the other one is uh, Classroom Without Words, Dot AI. Okay. And, uh, Dot AI, yes, come off my name, artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I got it's, that, yeah. It's one thing I thank my parents, one of the many things I thank my parents. Yeah. My <laughs> name, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so right now my business is at a six-figure level, and I'm really uh, passionate to grow this into a seven-figure level. And I also want to give a, uh, do a like classroom without wars scholarship foundation for people who cannot really afford my program. I can give them scholarship and invite them to join my program. And last year, as much as I hate COVID, COVID has also helped my business accelerate my business to a new level. It's the first time that I started to, to recruit students in the Middle East. So I'm really proud of myself for that. And I want to continue to expand the the uh, the regions and uh, the students that I can touch, the lives I can change on a yeah. global scale, have more students join me, join this classroom that was from different countries. And the video you showed in the very beginning is only the in-person component. Yeah. So for me, that the, the, that one was actually in Singapore. So as soon as COVID is over, you and said, I was in Singapore, that was in Singapore. That was in Singapore. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness! Wow. Because I want to take our children, especially students in the United States, they don't travel that much, right. and I really want to take them to a very unfamiliar environment. Because yeah. when you are in an unfamiliar environment, that's how you learn to think to understand who you are because nothing yeah. is making sense to you, right? That's yeah. how you literally start to think. Right. So I want to, uh, I was planning to do one in Japan last year, but I couldn't, but I want to add more global destinations to what I do in Asia, in Europe, and to really have this global kind of like, you know, school that you just like stay with us, travel with us, yes. with us you never graduate from. Yeah. I well, I say have, Singapore, oh, wow. Because um, my two older daughters, have been to Singapore and, and one spent some significant time there. And, uh, you know, in fact, I, I have to say, and, and um, it's been my priority, my, our priority, uh, my wife, Nancy and I, to make sure that our girls do travel and do see the world. We did not have that opportunity. It wasn't a natural thing actually mm -hmm. growing up for you to get on an airplane and fly to a, to a, to a foreign country where today uh, both my daughters have lived uh, globally uh, my older daughters and now my hopefully my senior is going to have the opportunity to live globally as well, too. And I love that you did that uh, in Singapore. And it just looks fantastic. Well, Dr. Many, I, I, just, just to add to another point, I mean, again, yeah. research has shown that many entrepreneurs, business leaders, they actually developed their idea by being overseas because finally your default state of thinking is being disrupted. If you are only in, it's like a fish cannot tell you what is water because you are always in the water unless you are in a different environment. So that is really my goal of taking our students to travel overseas so that their default state of being will be disrupted. Well, I couldn't agree more. And, I'll, you know, we, we're both book people, right? This one is on the bookshelf, mm -hmm. not far from me. You can see how tattered it is and all that. This is the story of Starbucks and Howard Schultz, the founder mm -hmm. of Starbucks. Okay. To your point, the idea of Starbucks came sitting in a cafe in Italy, okay, mm -hmm. and learning what uh, when you buy a cup of coffee, you buy a table, you know, mm -hmm. for the rest of the day, which mm -hmm. we now see as the, the Starbucks culture mm -hmm. would not have discovered that if he had not exactly. gone. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I know so many examples, but yes, you are. Yeah. 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 So I love what you say about that. Well, you know, uh, Dr. I, I, I'm being really conscious of time here. I've had you for 45 minutes. I don't want to be greedy with time. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, Anne says, cool, learning through travel sounds amazing. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And only as a witness, uh, my, my kids have been, I get to travel the U.S. in my consultancy. There you go. Oh, the bad education happens outside the classroom. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. No, I really appreciate this. Well, Dr. I, before I let you go, what do you want, want folks to know? How do they get in touch with you? I do have a website up here. Uh, but why don't you go ahead and and, uh, uh, and tell me where you want folks to reach out? Well, to. The best way to connect with me is uh, through LinkedIn. I check it very often. Or you can email me at ai at classroomwithoutwars.ai. So I want to do another plug for myself and my Oh, college. good, please. 
Yeah, we actually just uh, wrote this book and came out and uh, in alignment what, with what we believe in as disruptive educators is titled Skip the Degree, Save the Tuition. So wow. this is perfect for kids who are kind of young, like college or even high schoolers. So literally in this book, we teach you a practical way to skip the degree, save the tuition. Well, keep holding and, it up. Don't put it down. Keep holding it up there. You got, <laughs> you got to implant that in people's brains. So is that available on Amazon? Yeah, it's already available on Amazon. You can pre-order now. My co-author and I, she is a college dropout, but a successful multi-million dollar business owner. And I'm a professor dropout. So she and I, we partnered up to bring this book to you. We talk about the broken education model, the missing links. And we also showed you an A to Z pathway to develop and monetize a skill online. So it's a great book, check it out. And we also featured 40 plus self-made entrepreneurs in our book, including Seth, Seth Golden, Neil Patel, and many of my friends. And uh, last week, I interviewed one on my show. I have two shows myself. One focuses on business, another one focuses on education. So last week, I interviewed uh, Josiah, and he's only an eighth grade educator, uh, an eighth grade graduate. He has only an eighth grade education, but it's a self-made multi-million dollar millionaire. Wow. And wow. it's a political leader changing so many people's lives. So I want to share with students and parents an alternative pathway that is maybe even more promising than the tra yeah. traditional way of going to college, getting a degree. Yeah. So well, Dr. Yeah. I, maybe, maybe we can have you back with your co-author Julia there and talk about the book. I'd love to help you sell some books and I'd love to hear more about this topic. Uh, uh, I think it's just absolutely brilliant. You know, my dad, um, my dad had an eighth grade education. He was a world war two vet. He became mayor mm -hmm. of our town. Uh, mm -hmm. Never stopped learning, never stopped talking to people. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important uh, point that you made. So I really appreciate it. Well, Dr. I, your time is so valuable. I thank you very, very much. I'm going to have you head backstage and I want to say a proper goodbye to you, but for uh -huh. now, this is goodbye to our audience. So thank you again very much for being here today. All right. Take care. Wow. I promised you guys energy and did I give you energy or what? And the topic was absolutely incredible. Uh, not new to me. I have to admit, cause I've, I've kind of explored this whole idea that Dr. I brought up in the past. Uh, I mentioned an, another author before, too. It's something really we should spend our time learning more about. Well, listen, this is it for this week. I am back next week uh, with some exciting guests. Uh, we have a Disney executive joining us next week talking about research. But the one thing I really want to talk about, right to what Dr. I was just saying about, you know, what we do for careers. The next three weeks, I have a guest that makes her first appearance next week. We are going to talk about career choices. We're going to talk about resume building, and we're going to talk about how to find that job that you uh, really want over the next three weeks. So join us for that. With that, thank you very much for being here today. My name is Al Gettler. I'll see you next week here on LinkedIn Live, YouTube Live, and Facebook Live.